Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Among the many words you could use to describe author Jason Reynolds are best-selling, prolific at times, controversial, but he's also, as Jane Pauley discovered, the USA's official national ambassador for young people's literature. How does one properly address an ambassador? By my first name. <laughs> okay. He visits mostly out of the way towns like Ronan, Montana on the Flathead Indian Reservation. You're not there to sell your books. No. You're there to sell them on books. Yes. Who's listening? They're all listening. I don't sell them on books by selling them on books. The fastest way to lose a child is to tell a child to read. Instead, he encourages them to embrace their stories. To me, reading becomes a lot more palatable if young people realize that the stories, the books that exist within them, are as valuable as the books that exist on the outside of them. And we have to be able to imagine stories that don't exist. More excerpts from their conversation are coming up a little later in the show. As of today, you've sold how many books? Oh gosh, I think it's up six, six million, is it? It's, up, I, I, it's embarrassing to say. It's up, it's up there somewhere. <laughs> really high. And all of this in, uh, since 2014. Yes. So last summer I interviewed Stephen King. Mm. Prolific. One of the best. Yes. But you, sir, are also famously prolific. Mm. That's a lot, of, a lot of books sold and books written at yeah. the rate of how many a year? I think at, at this point, it, for a long time, it was two a year, sometimes three a year. Uh, but honestly, I think that the proliferation of my books comes from the sort of active nature of my imagination and curiosity. And if at any point I feel like I need a rest and I can't produce two or three books a year, that's absolutely fine. Um, my job every day is to wake up, tap into the part of me that is the storyteller, that is an imaginer, right? And, and, and do my job, do my work a little bit at a time every single day. And by the end of the year, you just happen to produce a lot of work. I don't see myself as some genius or as some like, you know, like I don't, or even a Stephen King. I just am faithful to the process. And on the other end of that faithfulness comes product. Then Seth Doan glides across a postcard perfect Italian lake on an elegant craft with a rich history. You wanted not just a boat, you wanted a Riva. First of all, a, a boat is a riva. No. <laughs> There's uh, no other sort of boat? No. You sell other it's, sorts of yeah, boats. Yeah, I know, but let's be honest. I mean, when you say I have a Ferrari, you need to say you have a car. Everybody knows what a Ferrari is. A riva is the same thing. A riva is beyond boating. A riva is a myth. It's a masterpiece. In Italy, we are obsessed, I would say, with beauty. Sometimes I say that we are condemned to beauty. Condemned? Because we live around beauty. We are surrounded by beauty. Something is not nice looking, something is not beautiful, it gives you a shock. So we can't live without. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. He's a towering figure with a thoughtful, soft-spoken demeanor. An acclaimed, insightful writer whose books have been banned in some places. Here's Jane Pauley with the best-selling author you might be meeting for the very first time. Jason Reynolds. A poet walks into a middle school. When you talk to kids, I'll bet you have them way before hello. <laughs> I hope so. When I walk out, the 16-year-olds or 12-year-olds are happy that I look like someone who might be able to connect. Jason Reynolds is not only a prolific and best-selling author, he's also the national ambassador for young people's literature. How does one properly address an ambassador? By my first name. <laughs> okay. He visits mostly out of the way towns like Ronan, Montana on the Flathead Indian Reservation. You're not there to sell your books. No. You're there to sell them on books. Yes. Who's listening? They're all listening. I don't sell them on books by selling them on books. The fastest way to lose a child is to tell a child to read. Instead, he encourages them to embrace their stories. To me, reading becomes a lot more palatable if young people realize that the stories, the books that exist within them, 
are as valuable as the books that exist on the outside of them. And we have to be able to imagine stories that don't exist. His story began in 1983. His parents divorced when he was 10. He grew up with his mom in Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. There were places that were safe. There were places that were not. And everyone was doing the best they could to coexist. Don't nobody believe nothing these days, which is why I haven't told nobody the story I'm about to tell you. Reynolds evokes his own childhood experiences in his 17 books, many published by Simon & Schuster, a division of CBS's parent company. I'm thinking about young Jason, the kids in my neighborhood. Are your readers primarily black? I think that they run the gamut. You have to remember these books are all over America and all over the world. But unfailingly, you are writing about a black child. Absolutely. My belief is that I get an opportunity to write them into the world, that they are matter and that they do matter. Did you feel invisible like you didn't matter? I did not have to rely on schooling to give me my visibility uh, because I had a mother who uh, had more than enough. <laughs> so much of my stories are about friends. And the reason why is because I actually think that friendship is the most valuable relationship we'll ever have. Friendship. Before he was a prolific poet, he was a precocious 16-year-old college freshman. At the University of Maryland in 2000, he met classmate Jason Griffin. Kind of a man, a man <laughs> teenager. He was like six foot three, 220 pounds, just a towering figure. But I didn't have any friends. One day, seeing Reynolds sitting alone in the dining hall, Griffin was intrigued. And he has this cool crocheted hat. And so there's my entry. I really like your hat. He was like, yeah, I made it. And I was like, OK. You crochet? I, was, I would make my own hats and bags and everything. It was cool to him, but I'm sure there were some people who were like, that's strange. I mean, the hippie people kid. People were like, definitely surprised when they came into our room and Monday Night Football was on, and there's a bunch of big dudes sitting around crocheting, <laughs> cause watching cause Monday I Night Football. everybody how to do it. I told everybody, once I figured out that it was cool for my friends, like, I could teach all of y'all how to do this. And they left college with a book. A poet, an artist, black, white, we were college roommates, now close friends. Reynolds' poems, Griffin's artwork. It went nowhere, and Reynolds sold clothes for the next five years. This is Stunt Boy. This guy right here. Him. He's the greatest superhero you never, ever heard of. But today, Jason Reynolds might be the best-selling author you've never heard of. A phenomenon in young adult literature, he sold more than 7 million books. And for only the second time, he and his longtime friend have collaborated on another book. I can't help but note the obvious. You have red hair and blue eyes. Yeah. <laughs> you are the whitest man in this room. Oh, yeah. I win that award often. <laughs> so your collaboration with the most successful hmm. author of young adult books who's writing two black children for all children, where do you come off? <laughs> you don't think we look alike? <laughs> Jason and I have had every uncomfortable conversation you can have and figured it out together. I think if anything, perhaps that can be modeled. A friendship, an honest friendship. As much as I love my culture, love being black, I also love my friend. Both of those things can coexist. And it feels like I'm the only person who can tell we're all suffocating. Their latest project, Ain't Burned All the Bright, is about a kid who's home at the height of the pandemic and the protests over the killing of George Floyd. The narrator goes hunting for an oxygen mask. Yes. Family's in quarantine and by the end realizes something important. That all the air you'll ever need is in the boredom of your life. That the magic is in the minuscule, in the mundane. You're controversial. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was barely 20 feet away. The guy on the ground was black, and he looked like he was around my age. And I A few sure of his books I have been banned in some places, like All American Boys, about two students 
One who is white witnesses a police officer beating up a classmate. Smashing his face into the sidewalk, the blood kept coming. If it's a story about race, some white parents are saying that I don't want my child reading this because I don't want them to feel bad about being a white child, which is never my intention, by the way. But it's being spun as a controversy, as a way to sort of put the kibosh on complicated conversations that kids are desperately trying to have. Jason Reynolds is still happily, comfortably having those complicated conversations. During one of his many school and library visits, a 12-year-old raised his hand. He says, why is it I almost never see white people in your books? Now, you could feel the air suck out of the room. And my response is, it's because I grew up in an all-black neighborhood. That's all right for those neighborhoods and, 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 and experiences to be lifted up. Does it bother you? Now, at this point, everyone's holding their breath, as you can imagine. Yeah, look, I'm, right? all, I'm the, all the adults, right? All the adults, everyone's like, oh, God. And he says, why would it bother me? No, I just, I'm, just, I'm just asking. And that is a child. More from Jane Polly and Jason Reynolds are coming up in just a few minutes. But first, all aboard as we drift away to Italy. You might not know the name Riva, but you probably recognize the timeless style of these boats. They've been featured in dozens of films and owned by movie stars, shakes, and other notables. Here's Seth Doan with the history of the Riva. It's a nice day for boating. Fantastic. There's nothing like her. This wooden 1970 Aquarama is not for sale. This is one piece of cedar from Lebanon but you'd never know that from how Alberto Galassi speaks. This one is a single piece of mahogany. His enthusiasm for this boat, a Riva. Wow, it has everything. Started long before he ran Ferretti Group, which now owns the brand. He took us out on Italy's picturesque Lake Iseo, racing past Riva's factory, as perhaps only the CEO could. You wanted not just a boat, you wanted a Riva. First of all, a, a boat is a Riva. No. <laughs> There's uh, no other sort of boat? No. You sell other it's, sorts of yeah, boats. Yeah, I know, but let's be honest. I mean, when you say I have a Ferrari, you need to say you have a car. Everybody knows what a Ferrari is. A Riva is the same thing. A Riva is beyond boating. A Riva is a myth. It's been in the hands of royals, movie stars, rock stars, shakes, kings, tycoons. Riva's Aquarama, designed by Carlo Riva, debuted in 1962 during the glamorous La Dolce Vita years of Italy's post-war boom. Stars including Sophia Loren, Brigitte Bardot, and Elizabeth Taylor owned Rivas. And the boat itself plays a supporting role in dozens of films. Don't shoot, don't shoot. Talk about product placement, Riva was featured in Portofino shuttling guests at the latest Kardashian wedding. They are the new Sophia Loren. They talk to the new generation. Why not? Times are changing. And times have changed for the company. While these wooden classics may be the spirit of Riva, the real money today is in super yachts, which Galassi says account for around 70% of Riva sales. But how do you keep the sense of what and made you famous that, that's in, in that super size? That's in details. Details that remind you of the previous models, the style. It's a bloody difficult job, I can tell you. Some of those original design choices are still echoed decades later in the new Anniversario model. It's a limited edition tribute to the Aquarama, which Riva stopped producing in 1996, spawning a new business, maintenance, the costly process of keeping them up. This one dates back to 1963. Richard Freebody showed us this Riva, dry docked for a tune-up at his boatyard on the Thames near London. What's different about a Riva from another wooden boat? That evocative feeling of the 60s and the glamour attached. It is the design. They were sort of the equivalent of a lovely Cadillac on the water. Freebody's company makes its own wooden boats. 
They're uh, beautiful. These are electric, but still have some more traditional details and extras. This is our famous uh, picnic drawer, which is becoming quite a, quite a must have. Nice. Everything um, you need for a picnic. Even a cake knife for those afternoon teas by the river. Very English. <laughs> Back in Italy, we saw some of that same attention to detail. Fabrizio Sonzogno was sanding wood for the Anniversario, which will get 20 coats of varnish. How do you feel working on a Riva? Come ti senti quando fai questo lavoro per Riva? Bello perché questo è l'anima del legno. It's beautiful because this is the spirit of the wood, he told us. You can feel it. Alberto Galassi is working to keep Riva's spirit alive. Though he says they'll never make an aquarama again, saying it would be a sin to try. It's a masterpiece. In Italy, we are obsessed, I would say, with beauty. Sometimes I say that we are condemned to beauty. Condemned. Because we live around beauty, we're surrounded by beauty. Something is not nice looking, something is not beautiful, it gives you a shock. So we can't live without. Sadly, most of us will have to live without a Riva. This one, nearly 50 years old, has gone up in value to roughly three quarters of a million dollars. But for a few minutes, it was still pretty sweet to get a taste of the Dolce Riva. I'm here because there was an art form that was going through its maturation process when I was 10. After the break, more with author Jason Reynolds. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more from the best-selling author of 17 young adult novels, Jason Reynolds. Your stories are from ripped from the headlines mm -hmm. or your imagination or from your life experience. I would say a, a bit of all of those. I think that it's impossible to write a good story unless you're able to pull from several sources. I think that my experiences serve as a, as a springboard, you know, a base point um, to begin sort of the seeds of a story. But I also am a person who lives in the world and the world affects my life every day. My community affects my life every day. The news affects my life every day. And so some of the headline stuff, you know, bleeds into the things that I do. And then naturally, I'm a, I'm a huge, uh, an ambassador, so to speak, of imagination. I, I think the imagination is the greatest thing that we actually possess, besides our actual stories. I think that without imagination, the world is over. And we have to be able to imagine a world we want to see. So I can take all of those things, my base point, the news, blend them with the imagination to make a new thing that feels familiar um, and personal. Imagination is... Uh the spark of the idea. Absolutely. After that, the hard stuff. <laughs> after that, the hard stuff. After, the work, right? After that, you'd better be a writer. <laughs> I guess in the beginning, you knew you were a writer because you left college with a book mm. pretty much ready to go. Sure, sure, <laughs> and sure. The, and the world uh, wasn't ready for it, or you weren't ready? It's such a good question. I think a bit of both. I think. I was ready to tell my story or to tell a story. And I think that the world was ready for it because my story is a story of the world. I just don't know if the industry was ready for it, right? So like, that, that's the way I'd rather put it. The world is always ready for our stories. The world is, you know, a pot of stories, you know? I just think that it takes a little time to get over that hump uh, when it comes to books existing in the world. But the stories themselves, you know, they come from the world. But were you a good, really a good writer? No, not to me now, right? I'm, if I look back on myself now, was I a good writer? To me, at this age, looking back, no. But in 20 years from now, I look back on myself in this moment and say I probably wasn't that good either, right? The goal is to always get a little better. Well, I should hope so. Right. Um, the astonishing thing for someone who has, let's get the, the numbers out there, as of today, you've sold how many books? Oh, gosh, I think it's up to six, six million, is it? It's up. I, it's embarrassing to say. It's up, it's up there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> really high. And all of this in, uh, since 2014. Yes. So last summer I interviewed Stephen King. Mm. 
prolific. One of the best. Yes. But you, sir, are also famously prolific. Mm. That's a lot of a lot of books sold and books written at yeah. the rate of how many a year? I think at, at this point, it, for a long time, it was two a year, sometimes three a year. Uh, but honestly, I think that the proliferation of my books comes from the sort of active nature of my imagination and curiosity. And if at any point I feel like I need a rest and I can't produce two or three books a year, that's absolutely fine. Um, my job every day is to wake up, tap into the part of me that is the storyteller, that is an imaginer, right? And, and, and do my job, do my work a little bit at a time every single day. And by the end of the year, you just happen to produce a lot of work. I don't see myself as some genius or as some like, you know, like I don't, or even a Stephen King. I just am faithful to the process. And on the other end of that faithfulness comes product. Can I ask you something real quick? Sure. You admitted that when you were in school, you only read the 20 pages that were assigned. Now the assumption is, right? I tell my story all the time. People have heard this story about, oh, I didn't read until I was almost 17. I didn't read the whole novel, right? So the assumption is that it's just me. Right? But it turns out, the great Jane Pauley, while you were in school, <laughs> while you were in school, only read the 20 pages you were assigned. My question to you is why? Why is that the case? I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that I have since read um, Pride and Prejudice countless times, Gatsby, a lot. Sure. So, um, but, since, since then. But <laughs> we were assigned Pride and Prejudice, and my friend Judy read it like crazy. Loved it. Because the love interest of Fitzgerald Darcy she substituted the name Dorsey. I hope I'm not embarrassing her. <laughs> she had a crush on a kid in, whose last name was Dorsey. That's why she projected herself as the protagonist of that book, and she was on fire for that book. It's amazing. I wasn't interested in this Dorsey guy, <laughs> you know? But no, I don't know. I didn't have anything better to do. Man. Let me ask you a question, but first I'll tell you something about me. I am here because of high school speech and debate. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? Because of rap music. <laughs> yeah. I'm here because there was an art form that was going through its maturation process when I was 10. It had started to grow up. And that music that came out of the Bronx about black children and brown children and their necessity to express themselves hooked itself in my psyche and saved me. That's why I'm here. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.